Hello and welcome to another episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. Today is Monday, July 27th, 2021, and this is episode 27A. Before we get going with things here, I would like to offer you a friendly reminder that I have just moved and I'm still getting the soundproofing set up for my recording room in the office here, so I apologize if there is unusually loud background noises. I've kind of done my best to close windows and doors. Um, and pad them to the best of my ability, but it is going to be potentially a little bit louder than usual. So I apologize for that. Um, but we do have a really fun episode planned today, so I'm excited to get to go ahead and jump right into that. Uh, we're going to start things off, as we usually do on a Monday a episode, with the weekly comic book pull list, things that are going to be coming out this week, which would be for DC Comics, the 27th, which is on Tuesday tomorrow, and for Marvel Comics, things that are coming out on Wednesday, the 28th of July. Well, it's rather everything, for every other publishing company, it comes out on the 28th. Um, after we talk about the comic book pull list, which there are quite a lot of really cool things to discuss, I'm very excited for that, we're going to briefly go over the Star Wars Bad Batch episode number 13. Um, not too much to say about it, but it was a cute little episode. And then after that, we have the Marvel October solicitations. I talked about the DC Comics October solicitations last week, so it's only fair that now the Marvel ones are released, I talk about those as well. Um, after the solicitations, I did forget to mention um, Marauders number 22, which did come out last week and had an extremely in my in my opinion exciting and important change that was made to x-men history so i'm going to talk about that a little bit before we briefly go over the tiny bit of mcu news that we have for this episode and the bit of pokemon news that we have for this episode and then we are going to wrap things up with this year's eisner award winners the eisners would be going on over comic-con san diego weekend which would have been Roughly this weekend, they did Comic Con online a little bit, and so we have the uh, a couple of the winners who I have picked out to announce. Um, if you have not heard, there's some kind of exciting series and creators who are being honored this year. Uh, before we get started, as usual, I'll go over my where you can find me online. Uh, I have an Instagram. It is Anna with the comics because my name is Anna and I have the comics. Um, you can also find me. Um, on Twitter, Savage She Geek. However, I don't use Twitter nearly as much as anything else. Um, this podcast is available everywhere podcasts stream, including YouTube, but not Pandora. I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, and y'all, and also you can find my YouTube page, Sensational She Geek, which has action figure review videos, including some imports and some higher end things, not just Marvel Legends and low end easy toys, twenty dollar toys. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can also find my website, which is sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. It's got the Weebly extension in there because I do not pay for it yet. Um, but if you would like to financially support the podcast, of course, minus the financially factor, just supporting the podcast, the best way to do that is to share it with other people who you think will also enjoy it and listen to it. But if you would like to um, completely voluntarily financially support the podcast. I have set up a podcast Patreon, which is just under Sensational She Geek. If you search that on Patreon, it'll be there. Um, I'm, I'm working on setting up some rewards for people who are signed up for the Patreon program uh, that include stickers that will come annually as being part of the program for thank yous and potentially other things like pins and further stickers along the line. Um, when I kind of get that stuff more figured out. It is very early in the Patreon days, but I am very excited to have that up and running. So if you, whatever you feel like this podcast may be worth for your semi-weekly entertainment, however often you listen, however much you listen to, uh, if you feel like it has earned any kind of uh, financial factor from you, the, the amount of a comic book a week or a month, the amount um, of a streaming service, of a movie rental, whatever you feel is appropriate. I am eternally grateful. And of course, if you are not supporting financially and just sharing it, equally grateful, any kind of support I get from the audience is always something that... <laughs> I am extremely grateful for. Um, so go ahead and check any of that stuff out, social media, patron program, YouTube, any of that, if you have any interests there. 
If you do want to skip over my comic book pull list chatter and get straight into everything that comes after that, you're going to want to skip to about an hour and three minutes in. I told you, man, there's a lot of stuff I'm really excited to talk about in the pull list this week. So if you, but if you want to pass all that goodness, it's an hour and three minutes in is where you want to go. This week's comic book pull list uh, is we're talking about things that for DC Comics are coming out on Tuesday, the 27th of July, and for all other publishers and publications coming out Wednesday, the 28th of July. Wednesday is the usual comic book day. It's just DC felt the need to separate that, and they're, they're doing stuff on Tuesdays now, and that's just fine. I'm going to go over some of the names of the comics that we're going to be discussing this week, and there are quite a few number ones and quite a few um, really really fun titles that um, this, this is definitely going to be a winner of a week. We're going to have a lot to talk about on the Friday episode where I recap all the comics, well, anything that I find to be worth mentioning about the comics, which oftentimes, sometimes it's not a lot, but it looks like with this week, we're going to have plenty to discuss. This is a big week for comics. Let's go ahead and go over the titles that we'll be discussing here. We have The Last Book You'll Ever Read, number one, Sweet Paprika, number one, Lady Death, Treacherous Infamy, number one, Amazing Fantasy, number one, and Batman Secret Files, Huntress, number one. Then we have Barbaric, number two, Batman Reptilian, number two, Wonder Woman Black and Gold, number two, Made in Korea, number three, The Mighty Valkyries, number four, Harley Harley Quinn, number five, Beta Ray Bill, number five, The Other History of the DC Universe, number five, Sonya Universal, number six, Eternals, number six, Black Cat, number eight, Black Widow, number nine, Strange Adventures, number 11, Cable, number 12, Daredevil, number 32, and Wonder Woman 776. I told you there was a lot, and there was a lot in here that I am very excited for, and there's a lot of key issues you have aside from we have several number ones and special editions coming out, like the Huntress, that's a special one-shot issue. We have final issues as well, Um, Beta Ray Bill number 5 of 5, the other history of the DC Universe number 5 of 5. We have a jumping on arc for Sonya Versal at number 6. We have the last issue of Eternals with number six. We have Felicia Hardy uh, possibly getting the Infinity Gauntlet or starting to get that direction in Black Cat number eight. We have New Eisner winning awards series Black Widow. We have the second to last issue of Strange Adventures. We have the final issue of Cable and then Daredevil is fantastic. So this is some really exciting stuff. Um, So let's go ahead and jump right to it. Starting, if you didn't notice there, that we're doing this in chronological order. So we're starting with like number ones, and then we're ending with Wonder Woman 776. Not because it's the least exciting thing on this list, although that is true for me personally. Sorry if that offends you. Um, I like non-can Wonder Woman stuff for some reason. It always is what I like better. But, um... Yes, we'll be, we'll be ending there, uh, because it is the highest number, <laughs> and also because I'm less excited to talk about it. I'm still waiting for 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 liking a canon Wonder Woman series to pick on for me. Waiting for that moment. <laughs> uh, but let's go ahead and get started with the number one. Starting off with the last book you'll ever read, number one. A couple of reasons that I was interested in this. Obviously, the solicitation has some amount of interest to it, which I will read in a second. Uh, but it's also written by Colin Bunn, who is, um, I've, I've seen a number of his, or read a number of his works at Marvel, and for the most part really enjoy them. I believe he did As Guardians of the Galaxy, um, is the one that comes off the top of my head as, uh, for me, one of my favorite ones from him. Um, but he has, he seems to have a, a fair amount of creative ideas in that head of his. So coming out with an indie book, I'm fairly excited for. I believe this is not his first recent indie project. Um, I believe he did The Blue Flame as well, which is going, which is on like only number two or three right now. So if you wanted to hop on that as well, it it wasn't really for me. Um, But this one seems to be a bit of a fun story. The art is going to be by, and I'll just go ahead and say this now, I butcher names, not on purpose. I, I try really hard but I'm usually wrong. <laughs> I'm oftentimes wrong. So I apologize if I'm for, for the names that I am bound to mispronounce here. But the artist here is Layla Lees, and here is what the solicitation says. Civilization is a lie. Hidden deep in our genes is the truth, and it is slowly clawing its way to the surface. 
Olivia Cade knows the truth, and she has become the prophet of the cl coming collapse. Her book, Satire, is an international bestseller, and it is being blamed for acts of senseless violence and bloodshed all over the world. Olivia's own life is in danger from those who have read her work. Determined to conduct a book tour, she hides security professional Connor Wilson to act as her bodyguard. She only has one requirement. He cannot read her work. So there's clearly something very creepy. Not, I mean, it could be creepy, but definitely supernatural in some sense happening here. Um, it's it's the kind of mystery that I feel like we're not going to get any answer to right away. But that is not a bad thing. I think that's fairly exciting if it plays out in, in an enjoyable fashion. I am all here for it. Sweet Paprika number one is by Murka Andolfo. It is entirely her brainchild. She writes it, she draws it, she colors it, and she created the characters in it. Um, I was at a loss for how to describe it, and I guess the best thing to do there is just, I know I've been doing this a lot, but honestly, the solicitation is the best way to describe this. Um, uh, if you are familiar with Murka Andolfo, um... If you follow her on social media, you'll probably be familiar with this little devil character, little demon character, um, called Paprika. <laughs> and this is finally Paprika getting a comic. Um, I think she's actually also in the works of an animated series in Italy, which is pretty exciting. Um, if something like that were to catch on, it would definitely get picked up in the US, that's kind of how those things go. But I'm on the fence about this series because of the character designs. Um, nothing, ro nothing wrong with them. They're perfectly fine. They just kind of give me the heebie-jeebies. You know, sometimes like it just like rubs you the wrong way. And I really like Mercury and Dolfo's art style. Don't get me wrong. I am a huge fan of her. But this, the, the, these particular characters just make me get the chills a little bit. <laughs> not in a fun way. But I'm going to pick up the first issue, not just because it has amazing variants by people like Art Germ, Pichamoko, Inyuk Lee, and Derek Chu, among others, but because I do want to support Murka Andolfo being a female creator, uh, making entirely her own projects, which is endlessly impressive in my mind. Um, even if it ends up being kind of meh, I will have supported her for that first issue, and that will hopefully help her in the future. So here is the solicitation. It says, Paprika is a successful businesswoman, a New Yorker of Italian origin. Job and career consume her, forcing her to neglect her personal needs as well as her friends and family. Her heart is broken from a previous relationship and its consequences, and a rigid upbringing has made her a very introverted person. She wants a romantic relationship, but she doesn't know what she's doing. Not like Dill, a naive and suave delivery boy with an angelic attitude, handsome and always surrounded by beautiful women falling for him. He doesn't have a worry in the world, and this makes Paprika very nervous, but he's the guy who could help with her feelings and with dot 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 sex. <laughs> Bridget Jones's diary meets sex in the city with a pinch of the Devil Wears Prada in the new international hit by acclaimed creator Mirka Andolfo, who, oh yes, she also worked in Unnatural, if you're familiar with that series. I think it was a miniseries as well. Um, if I am not mistaken, the characters of Dill and Paprika are an actual angel and demon. Unless this is some big metaphor that I'm only just realizing. It's possible, too. We have to pick up number one to find out for sure, won't we? I did- I kind of chuckled when I went over this, uh, but I did have a Lady Death Treacherous Infamy number one on here. Um, because I may actually be picking this up, I have a few- I'm a Lady Death fan. Um, you know, and to whatever extent I can really be a Lady Death fan. Um, because you can't really take it super seriously to be a fan of it, right? <laughs> Um, you actually, if you if you want to see uh, the recent Lady Death action figure, I do have a full review video of her on my YouTube page, Sensational She Geek, where I actually compare her with the '90s version, which it's it's something else. <laughs> You'll see when you watch the video. It's it's uh yeah, it, it's something else. But um, I, I love Lady Death is one of those like guilty pleasures for me that falls in the line of the vein of things like Red Sonia. Oh, hit my microphone again. Red Sonia, uh, Vampirella. Um, honestly, I feel like the Sailors, the, the Sailor Moon Pretty Guardians would fall into that. Um, there's a few other characters I'm sure who fall into that. Um, but they're, they're, it's like this this group of very particular strong women who are, you know, 
somewhat sexually open and out there. Um, but for a lot of it, they just have this... They were created with, like, a backbone of heavy metal, rock and roll, and blood, guts, and boobs, to be honest. Um, and I'm all for those things in comics, within reason, right? <laughs> so so naturally, I eventually came across Lady Death, and I think she's kind of cool. She's this girl who was called Hope as a human, and then I don't remember honestly what happened, but it's a whole complex story. She she came out first in the 90s um, under an evil Ernie comic, which honestly is probably one of the freakiest design characters ever. I don't think he's really around anymore, <laughs> which I'm fine with, but uh, Lady Death has kind of had a resurgence of late. Um, if you go to the Coffin Comics website, you can actually find Lady Death merch by fairly famous artists like Art Germ, and Stephen Sedgwick, which I'm sure I said wrong, um, and Mark Brooks. I actually have the Brooks and Art Germ prints, and they're very lovely, and you can get them signed by her creator, Brian Polito, which I'm not sure why, but, <laughs> but you can get it done. Um, so I have a few, I have a few older Lady Death books that I found in comic shops through the years, and I have a few newer ones that was, um, if you also go to the Coffin Comics website, they have kind of a Lady Death reading order for her modern, like, revamp. Um, because obviously she had her stuff back in the 90s, and then she kind of came back, like, 20 years later, and they actually made that part of the plot for the revamp, was how she had been under a spell for 20 years, thinking something else was going on when really she was basically dead. Um, spoilers, I guess? <laughs> but I've been trying to catch up with, um, all of these Lady- the, the more modern Lady Death things that are coming out, and I think- the last, I think when I last was ordering them, probably about a year ago, they were out with only like uh, number nine in the saga. Um, and this is number 12 in the saga. It's part one of two for in Treacherous Infamy, but in the modern Lady Death revamp, it's part 12, if that makes sense. Um, and I've only read, I think, the first three parts. I am. Well, actually, no, because they contain... I think each volume contains multiple segments. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. It's kind of a funky way that I started collecting it, so I get kind of confused about it. Because um, I have never collected her as her stuff has been coming out. So this will be a first for me if I find this issue on Wednesday. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a fan of Lady Death. Um, I think she's just cool and ridiculous. I won't say that it's written very well, because let's be honest, it's really not. Um, <laughs> but it's so much fun. It's a lot of fun, and she doesn't take any shit from anybody, and I, I, I back that. I back that 100%. Amazing Fantasy is back at Marvel, uh, with a number one coming from written and drawn and colored by Kari Andrews. Um, Kari is a artist who you may have seen, I'm sure you probably don't even realize you've seen a number of their covers across Marvel Comics. Um, I'm, I can't name any off the top of my head, but I, I know in my own collection, I tend to randomly find them and be like, oh wow, this is this person. You know how you do that sometimes after you learn about someone. Um, so they, they do some really fantastic covers. And here they are go going completely in charge of this new amazing fantasy series. I'm not sure how many issues it's going to be, um, but it's basically just going to be all of these um, crazy different worlds, these fantasy worlds of Marvel characters. And I'll just, I'll read this. I do have the solicitation here. Um, it says, experience these heroes like never before. Red Room, Black Widow, Teenage Spider-Man, World War II, Captain America, the most iconic versions of your favorite Marvel characters from across time and space, all wake up on an island of intrigue, darkness, and amazing fantasy. Are they dead? Are they dreaming? Or have they been transported to another fantastical realm? And is there any way for them to return home? This isn't just a love letter to your favorite Marvel eras. It's a reinvestment in the seminal characters you've always loved, plucked from their quintessential timelines. Brought to you by Kara Andres, blah, blah, blah. Amazing fantasy for the ages. Okay, so you see, it sounds like it could be very, very interesting. I have no doubt the art by Kara is going to be gorgeous. 
Um, I tend to really enjoy things that have a single, or I should just say less creators rather than more creators on board for it because you get a more streamlined vision. Um, so this having particularly just the one creator on board for the story and the art um, is what draws me to this. And I'm, I'm also dying of curiosity. <laughs> I don't think I have, yeah, there hasn't been an amazing fantasy series since I've collected comics for sure. Um, I'm not sure if there's been one while I was alive, probably. Um, but this is pretty cool. If it comes back and it's awesome, I would love to be a part of reading that. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up this number one and see what it's all about. Batman Secret Files Huntress number one is going to be by Mariko Tamaki and David Laffam. Um, Huntress obviously is a kind of fan favorite character. She's a member of the Birds of Prey, depending on what lineup you're talking about. Um, she, you know, in certain continuities, she is the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. Um, Helena Bertinelli, though, is her current canon name. She was, I believe, um, a descendant <laughs> descendant of the uh, Bertinelli crime family, um, who, if I'm not mistaken, don't really exist anymore. Um, I know that Marco Tamaki has been writing little Huntress stories in the Detective Comics issues, um, so this will no doubt be... Um, what that has all been leading up to. I'll read your solicit here. It says, Huntress returns in an all-new one-shot adventure. Gotham's Violet Vengeance. You know, I've never heard that you use Violet Vengeance. Is that what, do people call her that or do they just make that up? Sorry. Gotham's Violet Vengeance lived through a lot of the last few weeks, including her brain being invaded by a violent parasite bent on sending her a deadly slugfest blender. On is it like a slugfest bender? Not fun, am I right? Well, Helena Bertinelli is no one to mess with, and when the villainous Viles parasite gives her the ability to see through the eyes of his victims, you bet she's gonna track him down and pop an arrow in that slime ball. Look out, Batman! Huntress is on the prowl. So that kind of sounds like maybe Batman is gonna want to come out and stop her from killing this person. Um, I think at this point we all know that Batman is wrong about his no killing rule. <laughs> straight up wrong about it. Um, so I'll be curious to see how this ends, if, if he talks her out of it or if they even interact. Um, but I, I, I like the character of Helena Bertinelli. Uh, you don't see too much of her, I don't think, these days. Um, but I, um, Marco Tamaki, I'm a big fan of her. Her Detective Comics run has been absolutely killing it. Uh, so you can definitely, definitely consider this one to check out. Barbaric is coming out with its second issue this week. This is a series that, like I said, second issue, I am in this to win this. Um, this was one that easily within the first couple of pages, like with, uh, let's say, Homesick Pilots, a few others, absolutely, completely knew I was going to be in this for the whole long run. I don't know how many issues it's going to be, the way that I feel about it, I hope it goes on for a long ass time because Barbaric was what uh, it was shockingly good um, for a lot of reasons too. It was the art was really unique and perfect for the subject matter. The character design even more perfect. Um, you get the the main character Barbarian, an axe that gets drunk on blood, literally, and can talk to him like actually speaking to him. Um, you get this witch. He hates witches, but now he's t he's teamed up with this witch who has tattoos of weapons all over her body, and she can remove them and use them. That is so cool. I mean, at one point there was a pirate ship involved too. In the first issue, there was flashbacks of his backstory. I'm sure we'll get flashbacks of the witch's backstory at some point. Um, setting re really, really, really fast and easy putting us in the setting. This is basically Conan's world. This is basically like Conan. So, um, but with indie comics rules. So anything goes basically. Um, and that could mean, I mean, it does mean really awesome shit, but and I'm just like half of the stuff that I've said just comes from the very brief solicitation. More blood, more mayhem, more monsters. Will Owen storm the abbey with Soren the witch? Will the axe get drunk on blood? Yes, and you're going to love it. Damn right, solicitation. I am going to love it. You got that shit right. Um, this is by Michael Marici and Nathan Gooden. 
I, it's two dudes writing this and making it awesome. That's kind of, for, um, from my perspective as a reader, that doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> and so this it's just, this is awesome. Barbaric. Um, I know something that I said about it before was there's all of these, like, grimy, gory, badass, explicit, uh, nudity. You know, not so much nudity, I guess, but, like, there's there's a lot there's a there's a big trend right now in comics from what I can see, specifically out there indie comics, um, where they're doing a lot of high violence, um, shocking things like that among the pages. Which you know sometimes it's really awesome. Like what's the one my husband reads? Um, Ultra Mega. He loves Ultra Mega. I haven't gotten into it yet because I just you know have so much other stuff that I'm always reading. Um, but, you know, that was one that for him turned out really good is really high levels of gore and stuff in that. Barbaric, um, well, I should say before that, for for the most part, these ones don't really work out for me. I don't really have a problem with gore or explicitness in comics, as long as, you know, it's not something that you're going to go hand some kid and be like, hey, kid, you know, (laughs) let's not do that. Um... But they don't usually work out too well for me. They tend to just be over the top, focusing too much on the project and not on the plot. Um, just, just not, just not adding up for me. And Barbaric is one that had quite a bit of blood, gore in a way that was like perfectly balanced. Same with sex, and it was really good. <laughs> I, this one got me right on the nose, and I am super excited for literally whatever amount of it we get. If it's five issues, if it's 50 issues. I, I'm happy with whatever we get. It's going to be great. Batman Reptilian number two comes out this week. It is of, I believe, six issues. Um, we're not going to see the Reptilian until at least issue three, if not four. Um, the funny thing is this is by Garth Ennis with Liam Sharp. With Garth Ennis, if you are familiar or not familiar with him, he writes or wrote a lot of Punisher. He was one of the co-creators of Preacher and also The Boys. So <laughs> you see his style. It's pretty dark and violent. Um, bring that to Reptilian with Liam Sharp's art. Um, I don't even know what to say. It was... It was every paint, and, and this is Liam Sharp does do some stuff digital. He does do some oil painting. It does, he is a lot like Megan Hetrick in my mind in that way, where certain projects he puts a lot more effort in on because they're more passion projects. Um, especially on his interior, she does a lot more covers like that. Uh, and I, I, she's phenomenal. Look her up, Megan Hetrick. Um, but Liam Sharp, aside from as far as I can tell, based on his Twitter page, being a genuinely really nice guy and father. Um, bonkers artist, completely bonkers. He is one that I would list up there with Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, and there's other names that I can't quite recall because it's, you know, midday and the coffee's fading, but, (laughs) but Liam Sharp being the artist on this, he wasn't initially, he wasn't supposed to be the artist. Um, but he is, uh, and it's a best, best second option that could have possibly come. Um, really love it. And the, the, about the plot, um, the writing, we're, we're not really sure what we're going to get here. <laughs> the solicitations, which I'm not going to read you, they all have mentions of an actual reptilian creature. Based on the first issue, nothing has been seen It is something that is not actually killing these people. It is something that is causing these people to kill each other. If I, if you've read this and you took that a completely different way, I'm very curious to know because that's, I think my husband and I both took it that way. Um, and it's like, we're not, I, if if it, if that is correct, it's, it's a very exciting mystery for me, honestly. Um, this weird supernatural stuff. In any case, it is obviously supernatural, but whatever's happening it has not really been defined yet. So we're kind of feeling it out a little bit still. But in any case, um, yeah, just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Garth Ennis writing amazing stuff. I, I, it's six issues and I totally recommend it. It's also DC Black Label, so it's obviously not canon. Um, but really just 
it, it is great proof as to why Black Label needs to continue existing. We have Wonder Woman Black and Gold number two coming out this week, which I am kind of going to probably pick up because there's a couple of creators in it who I am a fan of, including Mariko Tamaki, who I've already spoken of, Stephanie Williams, who is working on with Vita Ayala, the new Nubia series, Nubia on the Amazon, starting in, I believe, October, uh, Corinne Howell and Jamie McKelvey, who are both artists who I'm familiar with, um, I, I only really buy these anthology books if there are artists or and writers in it who I am familiar with because um, they're, they're kind of toss-ups on the stories and the quality and stuff like that, to be completely honest. Um, but I'm, I'm probably going to pick this one up. It's got some great covers. Um, David... No, not David Nakayama. Um, I can't remember the name. He, he did uh, Daredevil back in the day. He wrote it. Um, but he's known for his art. He created Echo. I'm just having trouble with names today. Every day. Most days. Um, but yeah, Wonder Woman Black and Gold probably picked that one up for the second issue. Made in Korea number three is by Jeremy Holt and George Shaw. I'm... It's a, it's a cool little mystery, this series. It's, it's one part mystery, it's one part suspense, and it's one part, like, sci-fi drama. Possibly sci-fi horror? I'm not really sure. Uh, but definitely sci-fi in there somewhere. Um, it takes place also in a somewhat dystopian world where people don't really have kids anymore. Um, I think in the last issue they mentioned that the only schools that, that exist anymore are high school and up because there just aren't kids below that age. Because people just stopped being able to have kids. Um really freaky stuff. And so what they do to like overcome this emotional change in society is to create robot children. They don't age, they don't really ever change. Um, but, and, and they are often somewhat robotic in an obvious way. Um, this couple who are the main characters in this series, some of the main characters received a discounted robot who the manufacturer, who, who the engineer working for the manufacturer basically stole from the company and sent to America from Korea because he was trying to get it safe. Uh, he then gets fired from the company, as we see in the second issue, goes to America and tries to kidnap the robot back because he wants because now that he can have it, he wants it back. Very... But we don't know why. We know he put some special program in this child so that she would possibly learn faster, be more human, but we don't have details. And the way that we're just getting his... her creators, her engineer creators actions, um, and the way people around him are responding because he's kind of acting crazy um it, it's very it's very much a suspenseful story um dire direly interesting <laughs> because i want to know what it is that's going on with this little robot girl and what is gonna be the blowback of whatever is going on with this little robot girl um but but it's very cool if you're a fan of sci-fi robot stories check this out they also have little um little one shot they're not connected to the store to the main story, but they're like little one shots to um to like add a detail about some random robot child uh experience some family had. It's just a little bit more world building stuff and it's 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 pretty neat to have back there to check out uh, so far in both issues, so I imagine it'll keep going. The Mighty Valkyries number four is by Jason Aaron and Torin Grombeck. Sorry about that one. Um, I know that there are two stories in all of these issues that are eventually going to collide. We have the, um, the Jason Aaron and Torin Grombeck story, which is Jane Foster. And then we have just Torin on the, um, what is her name? I believe her name is Runa, uh, who is the newest Valkyrie, who is actually the oldest Valkyrie, but the newest to us. Uh, the story and how it's kind of been going is really, I'm very curious as to what everybody's motivations are um, and how that's going to affect anything because you have, let's see, you have Carnilla, who is Hella's wife, right? And she has, for some reason, 
stolen three babies from a woman's uterus as they were coming to, you know, fruition or whatever. <laughs> coming to growth. I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's actually a word for that, but whatever. Um, she has stolen them and she has changed them into little baby gods. Um, and she's hiding in hell in a little oasis with these triplets that she just stole from this lady. Um, and then there is... She let more out. More is a son of, well, child, children of Loki, who has two souls and one body. Um, it's either a wolf bot, it's a wolf soul and a man soul, or possibly two men's, two, you know, as guardian souls or whatever you want to say Loki is. Um, and they just go back and forth between a wolf and man form. I'm not really sure yet, but it's two souls in one body. Um, Carnilla let him out in exchange for him giving her like the seed of creation or something to make this oasis. So now he's out. Hela is sending Craven the hunter, who is really the son of Craven, if you want to get particular, uh, after him because she wants to kill him and we're not sure why. Um, Hela is also the child of Loki. So there's that could be involved. Uh, so he has been saved more has been saved by Jane because Jane is now a Valkyrie herself, a very special Valkyrie. Um, so there's a lot of kind of circulating plots here. Um, and it's all related and we haven't figured out yet how. Meanwhile, uh, Runa is trying to steal her wife's father is what I understand him to be. Um, from this crazy planet that kept him prisoner for like thousands of years or something. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all going to end up being connected somehow, but I have no idea how. Um, and I'm dying to know what Carnilla is doing with these little babies and why she stole them to make them gods. Also, they, they, I was starting to see a very problematic plot line. You, you, I may, may or may not be aware, um, in the U S at least, Black women have a much higher fatality rate, um, and there is a much higher rate of something in general just going wrong when they are pregnant and going through birth. These babies, they come from a black mother. The babies Carnilla stole, and we were kind of left here going, oh, okay, so she just stole these babies from this mother who was almost at full term. That's what it is, full term. Um, <laughs> she was almost at full term. And they're just gone. Could you even imagine? Like, just gone. And the doctors can't explain anything to her. They wouldn't be able to. Um, so, <laughs> I, you, you, you kind of see how that's becoming a bit of a problematic p plot line that they're just ignoring. Um, but then they fixed it by actually bringing her into the plot line to meet with Jane. And she asks Jane, because Jane is like resident supernatural knowledge person, uh, what happened to her babies? And so now Jane is in on the whole, well, she will be in on the whole thing that Carnilla's in on, figuring out why she's, why Hela's after more, figuring out what more is up to, why more was after Loki, if Loki is involved in anything else. It's very complex, but it's, I'm, I'm loving it. Also loving Harley Quinn number five. Uh, this is Stephanie Phillips and Riley Rosmo. Rosmo's art is extremely unique. <laughs> um, in a way that it doesn't work for a lot of stuff. Uh, but God, it works for Harley Quinn. It is like his art style was made to draw Harley Quinn. Uh, I also love the little redesign of her outfit that he gave her. It's quite cute. I like those little collars that don't really do anything. They just sit on your neck and not attach to anything. I think it's cute. Emma Frost has it too. Um, in this, we have um, issues happening at Arkham. You know, it's always Arkham, right? And the clowns, and she, she's got her clown friend Kevin, who was an ex-clown, and she was trying to help him, and then he got kidnapped, and... Uh, and then Har now Har the latest thing where we're at recently is Harley is trying to break back into Arkham to help her buddies or wherever they are before he goes strange, like basically kills them um, or rather him if it's just Kevin. Um, and she has a really cute sequence of her in like her own Harley Quinn bat suit that was really cute. Um, and this is going to be a series that goes on for a long time. We have, as I said in the last 
uh, last time one of these Harley Quinn issues came out, we have a lot of Stephanie Phillips Harley Quinn to look forward to because we have issues through October at least because we've got solicitations through October plus an annual additional on top of that by Stephanie Phillips. Uh, so if you are a fan of the Stephanie Phillips Harley Quinn, which if you have not read it, I really recommend it. I have read most, at least one issue out of most the past decade or so's comics for Harley. Didn't like any of them the way I like this one. This one is fantastic. I sing its praises every time I read it. It's just, it's so good. Um, so if you're a fan of Harley, I, I so recommend you check that one out. Beta Ray Bill number five is the final issue of Daniel Warren Johnson's Beta Ray Bill saga that nobody saw coming. We all thought it was going to be one thing. It ended up being an emotional roller coaster that we didn't expect. <laughs> At least I know I didn't expect it. Daniel Warren Johnson does write and draw this um, and does a pretty fantastic job, if I do say so myself. Um, we are into the last issue here, which is going to tell us the fate of Bill, if he's going to get the sword of Surtur, or if he's gonna probably get Surtur to destroy everything he knows and loves, what I imagine would be the losing option. Um, this is unfortunately just the five issue miniseries and it's already over. I really hope that this is the start of January Warren Johnson getting a lot more, uh, a lot more Marvel work to himself. I know he's done a bit of things for DC. I highly recommend you check out Wonder Woman Dead Earth. That was all him as well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. If you're a fan of Beta Ray Bill and you have not been reading the series, um, where have you been because you're missing out? Uh, definitely check this one out at least on Collected Edition if you have not, if you are a Beta Ray Bill fan. The other history of the DC Universe number five is also the final issue of this series by Oscar winning writer John Ridley and artist Andrea Cucci. This issue, they've all showcased various, um, I believe it's, it's various, yeah, various characters of color throughout the DC Universe showing kind of the DC history as they saw it go by. Uh, this issue is going to be about Anissa Pierce, who is the first daughter of Black Lightning, Jefferson Pierce, and then she has her little sister, who is Jennifer. Um, interestingly, I believe Jennifer actually appeared in the comics before Anissa, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then Anissa is more of a modern creation. I do have the solicitation of this one if you are curious at all about um, what what this is going to kind of be in this issue. It says, being a superhero runs in Anissa Pierce's family. It's been part of her life in one way or another since her father, Jefferson Pierce, first started to fight crime as Black Lightning. Despite what her parents tell her, despite what the world tells her, Anissa knows that she has the same calling as her father. But as Anissa takes on the mantle of thunder, she must grapple with a very different world than the one that she her father first patrolled. Um, this is one of a couple of things that are coming out this week that are going to be quite, well, I guess, uh, it's just this one this week. There's an announcement for one that I'll talk about later. Um, quite timely. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people don't like that about this series, that it does not really hide anything about the treatment of people of color in the real world and how that would translate to a fictional world. Um, it rubs a lot of people the wrong way because it makes them uncomfortable, um, I, I think you, sh I, if you're a fan of these characters, definitely read them. Any of these characters who have been in this series, because you're going to be able to get a very solid portrayal of what they feel, how they actually feel about their universe. And I think that's really rad. And it is by John Ridley, who, like I said, is an, is an Oscar winning writer. He wrote 10 year or er, 12 years a slave and won an Oscar for that. And he is going to be starting up some Marvel stuff soon as well. So we may not see him at DC in a while. So get it there while you can. So in universal number six, as it says in the uh, solicitation, all new story, all new Sonya's, perfect jumping on point for new readers. So that's really exciting if you are a fan of multiverses, if you are a fan of clone stories, um, Red Sonya, kooky bullshit, um, or creators, Christopher Hastings or Pascal Coano, because they are the um, creators on this series. Definitely check this out. I... <laughs> 
I, I got it, I got the first issue because I was like, oh, you know, so universal. It's probably going to be another one of those. They've been putting out so many, you know, honestly kind of lame Red Sonia and Vampirella stuff. This is probably just being one of the, another one of those. It's actually really enjoyable. The first five issues were all one arc, um, kind of of a Sonia um, battle royale in hell <laughs> that ended with uh, the Sonias freeing themselves from their uh, vows that they made their goddesses for their powers or their various gods. Um, really fun stuff. This is a jumping on point that it says, and this is going to be picking up with, uh, Noir Sonia, who is, um, I guess the detective Sonia. I'll read you what it says here. A low level criminal is suddenly making a big mysterious underworld splash which is remarkable considering that the guys very recently died. Sounds like a case for Noir Sonia. But not only does NS have this to solve the mystery of a successful cadaver, she's got to manage the arrival of a whole new ca- ca- cadre, cadre, cadre word of Sonia's that'll throw her investigation for a loop. More Sonia's. More stupid mysteries. I mean, what else are you going to want? What else can you ask for? Kieran Gillen and Asad Ribic's Eternals is wrapping up with issue number six this week. There are going to be a couple of things to look out for. In September, there is Eternals Thanos Rising number one, which is by Kieran Gillen and Dustin Weaver. That will be covering some of the Thanos connection to them that we're going to probably be leading off with on this series. And then once I get down there... Uh, Here it is. Eternals Forever is going to be a single issue one shot uh, by Ralph Macchio and Ramon Box covering, as I understand it, it's kind of going to be covering everybody so you kind of get a knowledge of who the characters are before the movie. And finally, there's going to be Eternals Celestia, which I believe is another one shot. Uh, This one is going to be by Kieran Gillen and Kay Zama. Seems like Kieran Gillen is the new Eternals head of the Eternals, um, and that is going to be another one shot going on about the future of the Eternals. Um, so after this Eternal series, if you enjoyed it, you do have a couple of things to look forward to. Unfortunately, they are several months in the future, but we also have the Eternals movie coming in, I want to say November. Um, I'm pretty excited for that. We're going to get a very broad look of a very zoomed out look of the Marvel Universe in a way that we have never seen in the movies. So that's going to be quite cool. Black Cat number eight. I am a huge fan of this Black Cat series and the one that came just before it. This is an Infinite Destinies tie-in where supposedly at some point Felicia is going to end up with the Infinity Gauntlet full of Infinity Gems. Uh, What it says here is, Felicia Hardy, a.k.a. the Black Cat, is hard to steal the Infinity Stones. Has anyone told her that these stones are now people? Regardless, Nick Fury will do anything to stop the stone bearers from being gathered, even if that means taking all of Felicia's nine lives. Black Cat has been picking away at the corners of the Marvel Universe, but this heist will put her square in the middle, just where she does not want to be. Very accurate for Black Cat. No, she does not like to be the center of attention. She does not like to be the center of anything like that um she is a cat you know she goes beneath the beneath the surface um but this has been this has been an endlessly enjoyable black cat series it's each issue just blows me away with honestly how well it's written and how uh, good a grasp the team has of felicia and her character and it's just phenomenal after phenomenal issue Black Widow number nine. Yes, the series did win the best new series Eisner Award this weekend. So congratulations to Kelly Thompson and Elena Casagrande for that achievement. And also Jordi Belair, who does the colors. Uh, This issue is um, going to be... It it seems to be that we're going to be pretty much going with... um, moving ahead, the four the four women that we've been seeing so far in this series. It's Black Widow, Yelena, um, Aranya, and then her new, like, ward, the, the widow's, like, new ward or whatever you want to call her, who is working with new powers herself. There's a good deal of mystery and everything that still has to be unfolded for this before they kind of figure out how to make sure that her new ward is safe. Um, but it sounds like it's going to be a pretty fun adventure. And if it just won an Eisner, 
that's going to be a lot more popular going forward as well, so make sure you jump on before everybody else beats you to it. Then we have Strange Adventures number 11, which is, of course, by Tom King with dueling artists Mitch Gerrids and Doc Shaner. It's very exciting. I know it gets mentioned every time anybody ever talks about this series, but having the two different artists with opposing art styles on the opposing stories that are being told from opposing perspectives is very interesting. Um, it's, it's a very unique use of art in comics, and I think it might have opened the door to a little bit of more kind of that style of creativity and storytelling for comics because this industry is always changing. Storytelling does change. The kind of stuff that we get now in what is known as excellent comics across the board are far and beyond leagues better than anything that could have been written in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, it, just the the way that they used to kind of walk you through absolutely everything and now between the artists and the writers they can put very minimal stuff on a page and based on the context clues of the art and the writing that has been in the issue it'll say the same thing as they would have said in the 70s in a whole paragraph um i hope that makes sense but that's just something that i get really sweaty about thinking about this uh how how this the the making of comics has changed so completely since their heyday you know um it, it's just such a different industry now for so many reasons so many reasons but in any case this is strange adventures number 11 of 12 as i said at the beginning uh, we had a big big moment in the last issue this whole series has pretty much been um it's the Justice League were suspicious of Adam Strange's um, having won this war on the planet Ran, which is where his wife is from, um, for various reasons. So he's like, go ahead, do an investigation on me. And so they get Mr. Terrific to do an investigation on him. Um, and we just, we just got his... Oh, he, we, <laughs> we just got it confirmed, okay? You get theories in these kinds of comics. Um, it's not Cloak and Dagger, but it's a mystery that is unfolding because he's literally learning the stuff that we're learning, more or less, as we go along. But we did get this big reveal in the last issue. Obviously, spoilers if you haven't read issue 10. Um, I had this big theory that Alana, who was Adam Strange's wife, had done something, made some deal with their daughter. Um, my husband and I had come up with this theory that maybe it's Adam who won the war with the Picts by trading, by, by giving them insider secrets to Earth and trading his daughter as collateral. That's literally what it is. We were fucking right. We were fucking right. We just got it confirmed in the last issue. I was losing my mind because how it happens, how we learn this, can get this confirmed, is a letter. It's a letter from Mr. Terrific to Alana Strange, basically saying, listen, I know that you have been pounding the drum for your husband's innocence and for this war with the pics that's now happening on Earth and how he's necessary for that. I know you've been pounding that drum harder than anybody, harder than him himself, but you gotta know what he did. And we find out that what he did, he literally did exactly what we were theorizing. It was, he went to the pics, he made a deal, I'll give you insider information on Earth so you can take over Earth, which is a way bigger, way bigger ballpark than just piddly little ran. Um, and to make sure that, you know, I don't double cross you or whatever, take my daughter. It's literally what happened. And Alana finds that out through a letter from Mr. Terrific, perfectly laying it out before her so that as it's happening, you know, she's sitting there and goes, fuck, he's right. Because the pieces so fall so perfectly into place. That was only issue 10. We're going into issue 11 of 12 now. So... What is going to happen in the next two issues? How can you even, how would something like this even be resolved? You have Adam Strange gave away the city of Phoenix. It's gone. There is no survivors. 
how are you how are they gonna wrap that up that's a big deal he didn't just like start to betray them he betrayed them um is he gonna get you know sent off earth well he, he doesn't have a choice he can't go go stay at Rand because he has that weird body jump thing that he can't control so like if his wife leaves him which I would if my husband took my child and traded her as collateral for starting a war on another planet. What? Yeah, I would. Yeah, we'd be done. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I really am not sure how this is going to end. And then when the Justice League and everybody else finds out too, I mean, justice is what they're going to want. But I, I mean, they're not going to end this by killing Adam Strange. I feel like that's definitely not going to happen. Um, so I don't know, but I'm, I'm super excited for how this is. It's, it has not been what I would call slow. It has been whatever the positive version of plotting along is. Plotting along is just kind of like, doop de doo This hasn't been like that. It's definitely been adding things together and creating stuff as it goes. Um, but it's been just kind of going steadily and now we're just, we're gaining a lot. We're, we got so much momentum now. Uh, and two issues left to see what that momentum is going to do, what we're going to hit, what we're going to crash into and explode or just slow down piddly at the end. I doubt that, but, um, really pumped for that. If you could not tell cable number 12 is another final issue. I am very sad. This is ending because I like the series and also because it's a Phil Noto interior on these series on the series. And I am a massive Phil Noto fan. I actually, Phil Noto is one of the few artists who I firmly would say I enjoy his interiors more than his covers. M usually the opposite is true. Uh, but for whatever reason, his interiors are totally where it's at for me. Um, this issue, this issue, the series has been exploring what you might have called Young Cable, um, who was the Dawn of, the only Cable that we've had in Jonathan Hickman's Dawn of X and etc. times. Um, and now is as it is in the comics, um, as of the last issue, Old Man Cable is back. The original Cable that we knew from the comics, aside from when he was born as baby Nathan, um, he is back. Um, they're trying to figure out what his clone, Strife, is doing. Um with mutant babies is, is some kind of weirdness that he's doing with mutant babies. What's really funny about strife is he's like, he's this ridiculous looking enormous, um, I don't know, like a berserker looking guy. He's, he, if you've seen the, um, what is it? The as guardian was it the destroyer. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. The destroyer. Um, the, the armor that Odin has, um, that was in the Thor movie the first one, uh, he kind of looks like that crossed with like Sauron. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's a weird looking dude. Um, <laughs> actually fun story. The first time I ever heard about strife in my life, uh, first time I encountered him in any form, I went to a comic con a comic convention probably less than a week later and there was somebody in full-blown strife regalia cosplay it is probably one of the most impressive cosplays i have ever seen to this day <laughs> fun story but anyway um cable and old man cable are trying to figure out what strife is up to i think this is probably gonna end with us thinking that it's gonna be just old man cable from here on out um, but I think that's probably going to end up not being true and we're going to stick with Nathan Young Cable as he is now um, for Dawn of X. You can, you can have Old Man Cable around there doing stuff as well, but I just feel like they're probably going to stick with uh, Young Cable because he has more stories available to tell in theory. Daredevil number 32. I say it every single time I talk about Daredevil. There has not been a single issue of the Chipsarsky Daredevil run that has not blown me away. Not a one. Um, not sure how he pulls that off. Um, I would say extreme understanding of the characters is probably a good starting point. <laughs> because he, he... God, he just does so well. He writes everything about Matt and his internal guilt 
and his religion and his belief this system and his thought process and his ideas of justice and right and wrong just absolutely everything to do with matt he he gets all of that perfectly and we have electra being daredevil right now trying to balance her style of enforcement really with matt's style of being daredevil um, and finding it to be not really possible. <laughs> we'll see if she ends up finding a balance, but as of right now, not really. We have Wilson Fisk, who has bonded with Typhoid Mary, who is sane, kind of now, um, going on their own agenda to take out their devils. Um, like, <laughs> and then and then Matt's Daredevil's in jail. Also, Matt's in jail as Daredevil. <laughs> he managed to swing that one, which is pretty wild still. But uh, And then on top of things, where we ended off in the last issue, we are back with Bullseye being the criminally insane, or rather clinically insane, uh, villain of Daredevil who back in the day killed... Um, was it Elektra he killed? Or was it... Yeah, it was, I think it was Elektra. And then it was also... Um, Susan? No. Whatever her name was, she was on the show. Karen. Karen Page. I think he killed her too, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, fun stuff. So but so uh, um Bullseye's back. Um we also have Lady Bullseye in the Spider Woman stuff, unrelated to this, but just a thought. Uh so Bullseye's back and he appears to be having hallucinations of an angel telling him to kill the people of the world. My theory was that that is some kind of new villain. Um, and what my husband actually wanted to point out was that the figure of the angel that we see that he's supposedly hallucinating looks mighty like um, the one above all, which is an Al Ewing immortal Hulk thing. The one below all and is like kind of the Hulk's devil sort of. It's not really that. It's, it's very, 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 very loosely it. And then you get the one above all, who's, like, supposed to be the god figure on the other side of that, um, who apparently looks a lot like this. And he had some explanation, I can't recall now, as to why the one above all would want to be killing people. Um, I think it's just because he's not, like, a necessarily good figure. He just is a figure. Um, but that's a, that's an interesting theory. That would be a really cool thing to have uh, Zarsky playing with here. And we do have art by Mike Hawthorne in this week's, in this month's Daredevil too. So no Marco Cacetto, but I think he's going to be back for the next issue. Um, he is like, ugh, I'm ridiculously good. So, but Hawthorne is really good with the prison sequences. Um, I just miss that Chiquetto Electra hair. <laughs> and finally, Wonder Woman 776. I have been not super fond of any Wonder Woman I have read for the any amount of time that's canon, honestly, ever. Um, I really wanted this to be better, and I have not been digging it. Um, that being said, part of why I don't think I was digging it is because the last, this first arc that they did, Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad, um, both writers, they kind of, like, had Diana as Sif, she was, like, in Valhalla and Asgard and hanging out with Thor and stuff. Like, it was not... It did not feel like Wonder Woman at all. Um, so now she is in the Sphere of the Gods. And I guess in a couple of issues in, like, October, I believe it is, she is going to wind up finally back on Earth. So I'm kind of debating with myself if I'm going to just drop it sooner or later. I genuinely have not been enjoying them, though. Um... I, yeah, that's all I gotta say about that. And that wraps up our pull list. <laughs> I only have a very, very, very quick discussion for the Bad Batch planned. It was episode 13 that came out this past Friday on the 16th, or sorry, the 23rd. Um, it was, it strayed away from, we had in the last episode seen um, a lot more characters from the Clone Wars. This strayed away from that and went back to main stuff with the Batch. So basically the, the overarch of this episode is how the Batch goes back to Sid's place, Sid being their underground employer, to find that Sid has been replaced by a guy called Roland Durand, who is actually the guy that they um, stole some creature from in an earlier episode in the season. So it ends up being the Batch go on a quest to 
get the bar back for Sid. Uh, and they're able to make it work because, once again, Omega proves her worth to them by low-key saving the day. Uh, it was a fun episode, um, but other than Sid owing the batch for having them have won her bar back and business back, nothing really changed or developed or moved forward too much. Uh, I know some people are saying that it was like the Star Wars version of a horror episode with the the flying bug creatures that swarmed and attacked them in the cave. But it wasn't really scary uh, as much as it was tense. But still a good episode. I, I'm really loving Omega's uh, personality as they've kind of been designing her. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to see her grow into that a lot better as well. And now, as I said that I would, we have the Marvel October solicitations. Um, I picked out, this is obviously not nearly all of the October solicitations, but this is just some of the stuff that I found to be relevant, interesting, or new and intriguing. So starting with Venom number one, uh, the Donny Cates Venom is wrapping up very soon. Actually, it already did wrap up with issue 300, and they're starting up again with issue one, I don't know why not 301. I don't know why they keep doing this legacy thing and then backtracking. Uh, and it will be written by both Al Ewing and Rom V with art by Brian Hitch. And, and I think we can see. We have covers by Peach Romoko, Todd Nock, John Romita Jr., Inyuk Lee, Elizabeth Tork, Bill Sinkovich, Sinkevich, and Gabrielle Del Otto. So if you are interested in any of those artists, check that out. Amazing Spider-Man 75 and 76. Now, if you remember, they are going to have three Spider-Man issues per month with the Spider-Man, like, board being Kelly Thompson, Saladin Ahmed, Cody Ziglar, Patrick Gleason, and Zev Wells. Um, so it, we weren't really sure how that was going to work. Um, and I'm still not 100% certain on that. Um, but... There appears to be that the 75 and 76 are both written primarily by Zeb Wells. However, 77 moves to, or Patrick Gleason on art, 77 moves to Kelly Thompson with Sarah Pacelli on art. Um, so I, I don't know. The way that they're kind of doing this multiple writers for three issues per month is a little bit odd, but we'll see kind of how that plays out, I guess, as we get into October. October also has the final issue of Immortal Hulk, which is issue number 50. That is Al Ewing passing Hulk to Donny Cates. Uh, and then we have Dark Ages, which is going to be continuing into number two of six. Um, this is going to be taking place apparently years after the first issue. Um... And it's going to be getting X-Men, Avengers, Vigilantes, and Villains to work together to create something better, it says. Um, but then we have Apocalypse, as in the person Apocalypse, who may be about to start the Apocalypse. So um, it's going to be a really fun series. It's written by Tom Taylor, who does excellent, in my opinion, outside of canon comic series. And then just to add a little cherry on top, there is a variant cover by Megan Hetrick, who I've already mentioned in this podcast is fantastic. And it's X-23, or rather Wolverine, um, Laura, whatever you want to call her, whichever name you choose. But um, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask my shop to give me that one. She is phenomenal on her covers. Death of Doctor Strange is kind of happening. I'm, I don't really understand the whole thing. But in October, we have Death of Doctor Strange issue 2 of 5 by Jed McKay and Lee Garbett. Uh, Death of Doctor Strange Avengers one shot. And the Death of Doctor Strange Strange Academy one shot. And that is by Scotty Young and then Alex Pacnadale for the Avengers one shot. Um, I had tweeted the creators to ask if Clea is going to be involved in any of this. I have yet to have a response. Inferno is going to be continuing on issue two of four. This is, of course, Jonathan Hickman's future event for the X-Men that I just cannot wait to get into. The cover of this issue is uh, Emma in her diamond form holding both the helmets of Magneto and Charles, helmet of Charles being Cerebro, um, which makes me wonder, is it possible that they might give Emma a little bit of her more villainous side back? I don't know. Um, we have variant covers of this issue by Pete Tromoka, Jeff DeCal, Oscar Vega, David Aha, and Oi Jusko. 
There is another Marvel's Voices coming in October called Community or Communades. Commun Communidades. I don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. But it is the Latino characters, the, Lati the Latinx characters from uh, the Marvel Universe. And we have as creators a, a, a wide list of Latinx creators, including Daniel Jose Oder, Carla Pacheco, Terry Bla, or is it Blas? I'm not sure. Juan Ponce, Leonardo Romero, and Edgar Delgado. And then we have art by Enid Balam, Vanessa Del Rey, Adriano Mello, oh, I love her, Leonardo Romero, Nico Leon, and Aletha E. Martinez. We have covers by Joe Casada, George Perez, Mateus Manhanini, Manhanini Maria Wolf, Nebest Zitro, Humberto Ramos, Natacha Bustos. Oh, and Natacha Bustos. Okay. Uh, and what it says here is, come join the, fe the festivities as Marvel celebrates the mighty Latinx heroes and creators from all corners of the Marvel Universe. Spider-Man, White Tiger, Ghost Rider, and so many more heroes get their moment in the sun as new fan-favorite creators continue to expand, new and fan-favorite creators continue to expand the world outside your window in Marvel's Voices, Comunidades. Featuring an introduction by renowned scholar Frederick Luis Al Aldama, plus an all-new hero takes the stage in a whirlwind adventure you won't want to miss. They seem to really be doing that a lot, sticking new heroes in these things, which I guess is fine, as long as they're written well. But that's one I will definitely be checking out. Uh, this is, Okay, so this one is the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, very socially relevant. It's called Luke Cage, City of Fire. It's going to be three issues. It's by Hoche Anderson and Farid Karima. Karami. Sorry, I had that backwards. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read this to you because I think that they are being very obvious with what this is going to be so that people don't pick it up and get mad about it. When a black man is murdered by a police officer in New York City, Luke Cage is called to action. But what does a good man do when protecting the streets puts him at odds with his own people? A cad is that supposed to be cadaver? A cadre of cursed cops, I don't know what that word is, uh, named the Regulators, are out to terrorize ordinary citizens, and with Daredevil determined to bring them down at no matter no, no matter the cost, and Mayor Fisk equal mi bleh, Mayor Fisk equally determined to use them to tighten his grip on the city. It's up to Cage to keep the city from completely going up in flames. I think you get it. I think that's going to be sick. It's you get Luke Cage against the cops. I mean, that's you you get it, right? <laughs> you see that. That's I there's no way I'm going to pass that up. Absolutely no way. Uh, there are also, coming in October, the continuation of a Khazar Lord of the Savage Land series, a King the Conqueror series, Black Panther's, uh, or sorry, John Ridley's Black Panther is going to be continuing. Um, I just want to read what it says here because I think this will be a really interesting issue. I think it was issue three or four that's going to be happening in October. It says, with assassins closing in on Wakanda's faith in him, and, oh god, let's try that again. With assassins closing in and Wakanda's faith in him shaken, T'Challa goes to visit Storm on the newly terraformed Mars. <clears throat> Araku. <clears throat> But this will not be a happy reunion, as T'Challa has ulterior motives for his visit. And back home, Shuri discovers who is behind the attacks on Wakanda's secret agents, a revelation that will change everything. I have not been reading, or had not been reading, the Black Panther series that just wrapped up a few months ago. I will be picking this up. I have been really digging what John Ridley has been doing at DC. Um, if this is his first step into Marvel stuff, I'm totally, I can't, I can't miss that. I'm going to check that out for sure. I already mentioned Eternals Forever number one and Eternal Celestia number one, two one shots coming in October. Forever will be the one that is kind of preceding the movie, but is not going to tie into the movie. It's just kind of an overall look at the characters in the world. Whereas Celestia, I will read the solicitation. It says, There is no god for the Eternals. Now that the truth of their existence is revealed, Ajak and Makari must pick up the pieces to try and find the road forward, no matter how terrifying it will be, or how their choices will irrevocably shock the rest of the Eternals. Also, how do the Avengers of 1 million BCE figure into it? Cool. Sounds good enough for me. I'm digging the, the Eternal stuff by Kieran Gillen, and that is one of his little projects, so count me in. Trial of Magneto number three will be continuing in October. That is Leia Williams with Lucas Wernick, Honest to God dream team for me. X-Men number four has a very brief solicitation that caught my eye, so I will read it to you. It's a Halloween. Oh, sorry. It's, it's a Halloween. Good job, Anna. It's Halloween, and the X-Men have to face a horn born 
of na- of a neighboring town in Westchester, the Headless Horseman, and that's not the only terror targeting them. That's literally all it says. I caught my eye. I was like, oh, come on. Yes. Halloween horror in X-Men? Obviously. Please, give it to me. X-Men 24, it looks like they are finally going back and continuing the Mikhail Rasputin stories. We had seen him, hadn't really seen much else. He was kind of just like there, and then there was the sword thing, and then he was not there. Um, and now he's finally back. Because remember, he has a sister and a brother who are on Krakoa, and that is Magic and Colossus. I would be honestly a little bit surprised if Magic gets pulled into X-Force, because Colossus is already in it. Um, I, I just don't really see... I just don't really see um, her really being brought into that. I don't know. Uh, the way that they've kind of set it up, it seems that Mikhail and uh, Peter, Piotr are much more connected than Magic. Even though if you have read the um, Truth or Death Magic series, it's like three or four issues, you will know that Magic dies when she dies of the legacy virus in the year... I think it's the year 2000, but it's X-Men 300 and... It's either 301 or 303, I don't remember. Um, But in any case, she dies of the legacy virus, and then in that Magic Truth or Death series, it's like a flashback series, um, and we learn that she actually got the legacy virus from her own brother, tricking her to go back in time. So, (laughs) that's pretty dark, isn't it? But anyway... Uh, Mikhail will be in X- X- Force, X-Force 24. Other X-Books seem to be continuing like normal. Avengers 49, the quote-unquote World War She-Hulk continues. It says, War beneath the waves. The Winter Hulk has sent has been sent to Atlantis with a dark mission, and things will get even darker and bloodier if the Winter, or if the Russian super assassin Red Widow has her way. But no matter who wins, She-Hulk and the Avengers will be changed forever. I mean, you've already made her the Winter Hulk. I feel like that's changed forever. And I was, I was like, torturing the characters. You, She literally, in 2016, already went through a bunch of bullshit with her emotional state and her mental state. And we're doing it again five years, five years later? Ugh. Anyway. Uh, Phoenix Song, Echo, number one. It's going to be a five-issue series written by Rebecca Roanhorse and art by Luca Maresca. Uh, covers by Corey Smith, Oscar Vega, and Lino Francis Yu. I'm a big fan of him. I, he actually follows me on Instagram, which is pretty cool. And what it says about this is obviously going to be about Echo, who is the new Phoenix. Um, Maya Lopez Echo. So let's let's get you the solicitation. Against all odds, one of the most powerful entities in the Marvel Universe chose Maya Lopez, a deaf street fighter, as its new avatar. And the burning question on everyone's mind is, Why? But Echo is the last person to answer. Still learning her new cosmic abilities and struggling with the Phoenix's overwhelming personality, Echo strikes out to learn to return to her roots. But the reservation has even fewer answers. And where she goes, evil fall. Where power goes, evil follow- uh, follows. <laughs> Someone wants Echo to fail and unleash a power only the greatest heroes in history have been able to control. Artist Luca Maresca joins superstar writer Mar- Rebecca Roadhouse for a story that will light the universe on fire. I'm down. I mean, I'm a fan of Echo. She's going to be in the MCU. I would bet she's probably going to be in the MCU as um, Ronin. Because we had Hawkeye Ronin, and we know she Echo was Ronin at one point as well. Just my thought. It might be like a really obvious thing. I don't know. It's just my thought. Captain Marvel 33 is going to be coming out in October. It's going to be the various dark Captain Marvels going after her and Ms. Marvel. Okay. Black Widow number 12 looks like it is going to be, I already said this actually, it looks like it's going to be uh, the four ladies. You get Black Widow, White Widow, Aranya, and whoever this new girl is, whose name I am having issues remembering. Um, but this this cover for 33 is like, honestly, like almost like a, like a rap album cover with the four of them. It's awesome. Uh, and then we have uh, Thor number 18 is going to be starring Throg in some way or another. So that's exciting. I love that little motherfucker. And Defenders, uh, which is going to be a five issue mini series happening in the fall, is going to be on issue three of five. That is all the X Men solicitation crap I wanted to talk about today. Um, I really wanted to talk about this thing that happened in Marauders number 22. Um, because. I talk a lot on this podcast about this this term refrigeration, right? And I don't mean okay, like 
It kind of does mean sticking things in a refrigerator. What it comes from, okay, what it means is when you in some way emotionally or physically harm or kill a usually female character um, to push forward the plot uh, and characterization of a usually male character, where it comes from, um, is I was I believe it was Kyle Rayner had a girlfriend in like the 90s or the 80s. Um, who got killed and she got shoved in a refrigerator so that he could further his plot and grow from it. So they came up with this term refrigeration to kind of like call those things out when we see them. <laughs> um, there was this thing that happened back in, must be the 70s. I, I think it was the early 70s. Um, it's a character called Lord Chantal. She was the romantic partner of um, Sebastian Shaw, involved with the Hellfire Club, with Emma Frost, and the other guy whose name nobody ever remembers. Um, in the thing about her, Lord Chantal, she was Spanish. She's from Madrid, um, and apparently had like this interesting love kind of relationship with Shaw. Um, and what happens in this issue, the only issue that she really appeared in, X-Men 99, which was redone as X-Men Classic number 7, she basically saves Shaw's life, uh, sacrifices herself to save him when a Sentinel tries to kill him. Now, um, the reveal in Marauders number 22, I'm, I'm still like... I'm just, I, I want to commission somebody a print of Emma and, and Lords because this, ugh, talk about the power of female friendship. Oh my God. So the reveal was that long, she, she, although she died long before Cerebra was put online, and that's why they keep telling Shaw they couldn't bring her back. The truth is they can't bring her back because she never died. Instead, she had, before that moment in X-Men 99 or X-Men Classic number 7, whichever way you go with, she had approached Emma that day while they were getting ready for this party with bruises on her face to ask for help with an abusive Shaw. So Emma, being the badass babe she is, of course, is able to create a psychic illusion that only the men in the room see, where they see Lord sacrificing herself so Shaw would believe her to be dead and never go looking for her. However, she's still alive and well, which is the truth of why she can't be resurrected. Um, Emma hooked Lords up with Wilson Fisk, not like that. He gave her a new identity. This, this, this single-handedly solved a tragic and pointless mishandling of a classic female character who could have had such a beautiful history if they hadn't just killed her off literally on her first appearance. And this fixes that and this gives her a potential for a new life and new time in the comics and honestly makes me hate Shaw even more, but we all hate him anyway, so who cares? <laughs> but I just, I wanted to, I didn't mention it last week honestly forgot. Um, so I just wanted to mention it this week because that, to me, that is such a, such a big moment. The MCU news that I had for today is very small. I'm sorry if you're looking forward to something really big. Uh, it is Quantumania started filming today, which was announced by the director, I believe, in a photo from set where, uh, he had, you know, Cassie's ugly bunny rabbit that her dad gave her. Uh, on set, so I guess it's something that she keeps around, or possibly he keeps in his office, who knows. And that is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and yes, that is the movie that Kang is supposed to be the main villain in. There has been announced just today, <laughs> there will be a live-action Pokemon series featuring Pikachu, and it's in the works at Netflix. <laughs> They said it's going to be in the vein of Detective Pikachu, which I'll give it. It's, that was a pretty good movie. I will give it that. I had fun with that movie. Um, but I don't know about this. <laughs> Netflix has done a number of animated Pokemon projects. This will be live action. We know that they have tried at least one other live action adaption. It was of a manga slash anime. 
Uh, and we all know how that went. We won't, we won't mention any names here, <clears throat> but it sucked. Um, so it's kind of like, this, this could be really good or really just the worst decision they ever made as a company. I mean, probably not that because I'm sure if it's terrible, they'll still make a buttload of money. It is uh, notably executive written and produced, sorry, executive produced and written by Joe Henderson, who also runs The Lucifer Show, which is now moved to Netflix, and he just started adapting Shadecraft, which is a fairly recent indie comic for Netflix as well. Um, so he definitely is really into comic book stuff, and I would consider, you know, Pokemon is in that same realm of nerdy, nerdy, nerdities, so it could work. Um, or it could be the worst thing you've ever seen. Who's to say? <laughs> uh, finally, to wrap things up today, we have some Eisner winners. There is a much longer list of Eisner winners. The complete Eisner list of winners is on comiccon.org. That is comic-con.org. Uh, what we have for Eisner winners, I picked out just a handful of awards that had names of some kind that I recognized for it. So we have Best Continuing Series, Usagi Yojimbo, Yojimbo. I have not read this myself, but I have been hearing some pretty incredible stuff about it. It comes from IDW, and it is by Stan Sakai. Uh, Best Limited Series was Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen by Matt Fraction and Steve Leiber. That's at DC, obviously. Uh, they also won Best Humor Publication for the same series. As I said a couple of times already, Black Widow did win Best New Series for Kelly Thompson and Elena Casagrande at Marvel. Superman Smashes the Clan won a number of a uh, number of rewards, including Best Publication for Kids Ages 9 to 12. However, I would like to add to that, this is definitely an all-ages comic. It says 9 to 12. I feel like this is something that anybody of any age can pick up and enjoy. I myself certainly enjoyed it. I'm very happy to own it now. Um, and, well, owning it uncollected, I should say. Um, it's fantastic. It is by Jean Luen Yang and Guri Hiru. Uh, Jean Luen Yang is an Asian American writer who has pretty much blown me out of the water for everything that I've read by him. And Guri Hiru is a duo of female, um, I want to say Japanese artists. I'll have to check on that one. Uh, but they are just. I mean, their style is the cutest thing. If you saw the Heroes at Home uh, little comics that were done with... I don't remember who the who the writer on that was, but if you read, if you saw any of those Heroes at Home comics, those were done by Guri Hero. They have a very recognizable art style, and I, I, I love to read what they put out. Best Humor Publication, as I said, Superman's pal Jamie Olsen. Uh, best comics related journalism or periodical was Women Write About Comics, which is actually a site that I go to. It's womenwriteaboutcomics.com. Um, so that was pretty cool to see. They, that site is edited by Nola Fow and Wendy Brown. And finally, uh, Peach Romoko won for Best Cover Artist, which is awesome. They have a number of things listed here that she did in 2020, including, or whatever year we're talking about here, including Buffy the Vampire Slayer, number 19, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, number 2, Something's Killing the Children, number 12, Power Rangers, number 1 from Boom Studios, Dynamite, which is the Dynamite series, Vampirella, The Crow, Leith, and various Marvel variants. She's done, honestly, so much more than that, but there's no way that they were going to be able to list it all there. I think that wraps up this week's podcast. Thank you again for listening for whatever amount of time that you do listen to. Um, I greatly appreciate all the support that anybody gives. As I did mention in the beginning, the best way to support the podcast in a free and not financially costing way is to just share it with people. Share it with people you think will listen will listen to it, with people um, just on your social media pages, or you know, just you know, if you go if you join my patron program, I'll send you stickers, and you can slap the stickers all over stuff, and that's sharing it too. Uh, joining the patron program would be how to financially back the podcast support the podcast uh, as any any time that I can spend not working a real job I can spend working on this podcast so the more financial backing I get for the podcast the more I will be able to work on it and presumably the better it will get my next podcast episode is going to be up this coming Friday the 30th 
I'm not sure what we're going to talk about on that. I mean, we know, I know in part it's going to be the picks, the comic book picks, things that I find to be new, interesting, relevant, or just good um, from this week's comics. But we don't have any Wednesday, um, we don't have any Wednesday Loki. Loki's over. The behind the scenes for Loki was last week. So, uh, maybe I'll check and see if Superman and Lois is back. I have no idea. I should know that. <laughs> I think they should be by now. Um, but we'll have, we'll have plenty of stuff to talk about. Don't you worry it. Worry at all. <laughs> I literally have it on my Instagram. I can talk your ear off about comics. And if it's not obvious, that is super true. So, uh, there will always be comics to talk about. There will always be comic related things to talk about. Um, and I will always be excited to talk about comics with y'all. So, um, if you do have any kind of questions, comments, concerns, theories you'd like to share, thoughts about how mad you are that it wasn't Clint who died, in a game, you know, stuff like that. Go ahead and shout me out wherever it is that you listen to this on or social media. Like I said, my Instagram's Anna with the comics. Um, I would love to interact with the little community here uh, because I know there is one, but you're very quiet. (laughs) So um, that makes sense because you listen to me and I in my life, I'm very quiet. I just talk about comics until my throat hurts. I'm going to go get some water and maybe a cough drop. So have a great week, guys. The weather is weird where I am. It's hot and rainy, apparently. So stay dry, stay cool, get sweaty about comics, and don't be an asshole. Peace.